Uh, my name is Henry Powell. Um, and I'm going to talk about dizziness. It's the most dreaded topic for most of us, I think. You know, we're all surgeons. We don't like talking about medicine. We don't like talking about dizziness. But actually, we can make it simpler. So this is what I'm hoping to achieve today, is to make it simple. Um, 20 to 30 percent of our population experience dizziness. And by the time they come to us, sadly, um, they, 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 they rather like talking to us for a very long time because um, they have very vague symptoms and they are too happy to see us. Um, so when we conduct consultations, I always categorize in my head, central, vestibular, cardiovascular, and others uh, by asking very closed questions, not open questions about how are you, uh, or, or anything like that. You can greet them by saying, how are you? But you need to ask very specific questions if you want to get back for dinner at home. Central. So central courses, um, they, they normally present with very vague symptoms. Sometimes um, they have um, headaches, especially in the, in the ones who have um, vestibular migraine or space occupying lesions. They also present with other uh, neurological problems like numbness and retrovulbar pain, which is quite an important thing to ask, okay? Uh, because these are quite specific for multiple sclerosis patients. They normally walk into your clinic with unusual gait or veering to one side. And in those cases, you think cerebellar. So during a clinical examination uh, for the central uh, neurological patients, um, you look specifically for the, for the following three things, I think. Vertical nystagmus, in vestibular problem, you almost never see vertical nystagmus. You look for facial weakness or um, rather big acoustic neuromas or vestibular schwannomas, and you also look for unusual gaits as well for cerebellar problem. Nowadays, from a practical point of view, if you want to protect yourself medical legally, always, if in doubt, do an MRI scan. This was a patient who, 17-year-old, um, the only presentation he had was he couldn't slam dunk properly. He was fine. But when we did the MRI scan, because the history didn't quite fit, it showed a rather large vestibular schwannoma. So MRI scan if you're not sure. This is a typical appearance of um, multiple sclerosis. You can probably see the, uh, the white plaques here around uh, the ventricles as well. Um, this is typical of multiple sclerosis. And hence the question, uh, retrovulvar pain is quite important. Now, this is more interesting to us because as ENT surgeons, we, we normally see these um, four, I call this the fab four, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, menias, migraine, and vestibular neuronitis. I'm going to concentrate on the top two because I normally see these quite a lot when I was um, in the UK because we, we had a tertiary center for otology. BPPV, it stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. A vertigo comes from, a Latin, came from the Latin word verto or vertir, which means spinning. That's why it's so important in the history, you ask specific questions about their presentation. Is it spinning or is it something else? If it's spinning, then you can think Fab 4 and it makes your uh, clinical diagnosis that much easier. The vertigo would last for a few seconds to a few minutes, uh, and uh, BPPV um, is normally associated with movement of the head. The Barani Society described it as a, a recurrent episode of vertigo provoked by positional change, which is very, very accurate. This is normally due to otoliths in the posterior semicircular canal. About 80 to 90% of the patients have posterior semicircular canal problems. A few have lateral semicircular canal otoliths, and very rarely, they are probably seen one or two um, in these years uh, with um, anterior or superior semicircular canal 
otoliths. I pinched this from a paper. Um, I thought that was very useful. When you do Hall-Pike's test, if the patient, when you turn the head to the right-hand side and lie, lay them down to very quickly, if you see a rightward torsion upbeating in this diagnosis, it's a right posterior semicircular canal problem. But if you see a rightward torsional but downbeating diagnosis, which is very rare, it's likely to be a superior or anterior uh, semicircular canal uh, problem. And it's the opposite for the left hand side. This is quite important when it comes to treatment. So I mentioned clinical examination, hall pikes for posterior semicircular canal problem, supine head turning test for lateral canal uh, problem. I'm going to talk about um, quite briefly about um, canalithic, which is geotropic um, nystagmus, and cupulolithic, which is apogeotropic. Geotropic means the fast face of the nystagmus is towards the ground, towards the gravity. That's why it's called geotropic. If the fast face is going up, it's apogeotropic. And in order to determine the affected side, we need to compare the intensities of the nystagmus to see which side is, is actually worse. So when you approach a patient with a suspected lateral semicircular canal problem, when you do the test, you determine the size. So for example, you lie them down, turn the head to the, to the right-hand side. You look at the type of nystagmus. Is it horizontal? If it is, it's likely to be lateral semicircular canal problem. You look at the direction of the nystagmus. So for example, if it's a geotropic nystagmus, so the, the fast face is towards the right-hand side, when you turn the patient to the right-hand side and it's towards the ground, then it's likely to be a right-sided canalithic lateral semicircular canal problem. The reason why we need to determine that is because when we do the Gufoni maneuver, we need to know if we need to turn the patient's head down or do we need to turn the patient's head upwards, which I'll explain later. So treatment for posterior semicircular canal problem, we normally um, do the Epley maneuver that we all know about. There is one called Seamont maneuver, which is a rather violent uh, maneuver, I think. Um, and uh, I, I don't normally do this very often. For lateral semicircular canal treatments, you have the barbecue roll or the gufoni, which I prefer really, uh, because you can uh, uh, do the different type of gufoni according to the geotropic or is it apogeotropic problem. Brandt Daroff exercises, which people can YouTube or, or Google about. Uh, this is for patients who can't really come to your clinic, but they need some help, then they can do that at home. It has been described, uh, the treatments for um, superior TV, like reversed Epley and Yakovinos. I have to say, I haven't done this, these uh, maneuvers myself over the past 20 years or so. So Hall Pikes. Uh, test, this is the test, this is not the treatment. Hallpikes is a clinical examination test. You look for rotational nystagmus, as I've described before. They last for minutes. And the most important thing is that these nystagmus, they fatigue. This is just an example of, okay, can anyone tell me which side this, this is? CPPV, small audience, but um, it's a left-hand side because it's um, towards the left-hand side, it, it's upbeat to the left. So that's the, the typical rotational nystagmus for left BPPV, which is fatigue. So for treatment of um, posterior canal BPPV, uh, normally it's Epley maneuver. And I'm, hopefully I can show you 
So you do the Hall-Pikes test, you look for rotational nystagmus at this stage, um, up beating, and therefore you know this is um, right-sided posterior canal um, BPPV, and then you proceed to your Epley maneuver. I can work this. Then you wait for the nystagmus to stop and turn the patient all the way over onto the contralateral side. Practical tip. You wait, you basically turn the patient's face facing the floor and you wait until the patient's uh, vertigo uh, would subside. It's a key part of the Epley maneuver. Turning the patient's face facing the floor, waiting for the nystagmus and the dizziness to go. Absolute key in the Epley maneuver. It improves your success rate. Once the patient is settled, you sit them up and keep an eye on them. Make sure they don't fall off the bed. Okay. Now, Buffoni, this is for lateral semicircular, lateral semicircular canal BPPV. Again, a really good demonstration uh, that I could find on the internet. You sit the patient up facing you and lie them down on their side, on the lateral side, right sided geotropic lateral semicircular canal BPPV. You lie them to the left hand side and then face them downwards, geotropic, towards the, towards the ground, towards gravity. If the patient has the apogeotropic problem on the right-hand side, you do the same thing, but with their face facing upwards. That's why when you make the diagnosis of canalithic, or is it copulolithic, and that's why it's important to know, um, because this would determine how you do the euphony. So some updates from recent papers, BPPV. We, we all know about the otoliths. So one study actually showed us that instead of doing clinical examination, they could look at blood biomarkers, otolin-1. Otolin-1 is the collagen that you find in the inner ear that forms um, otoliths. People have talked about using questionnaires, IT, AI, that sort of stuff, diagnosing CPPV. But I am old and also old style. I prefer to see the patient and make a diagnosis myself. Risk factors. Female, hypertensive patients, diabetic, high lipids, osteoporosis, and vitamin D deficiency have all been shown to be risk factors for BPPV. Now I move on to the next topic, many years disease. Um, fairly common, first described in 1861 by Prosper Menier, and it was described as the recurrent spontaneous vertigo associated with tinnitus, fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss, and oral fullness. There's no real clinical examination for many years disease, and it, it's all in the history, okay? That's why you need Going back to my first slide, you need closed questions to establish your diagnosis. Various diagnostic criteria have been described, and the latest one is in 2020 uh, at the American Academy. This is what it is. This is what they have said about definite and probable many disease. For definite, two or more uh, spontaneous attacks of true versions, spinning each lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours. Audiometrical um, uh, evidence of sensory neural hearing loss in the affected ear on at least one occasion or during or after one of the episodes of vertigo. Fluctuating oral symptoms, hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness in the affected ear and other causes excluded by other tests. Probable MD, 
uh, at least two episodes of vertigo or dizziness lasting 20 minutes to 24 hours, fluctuating oral symptoms, same as before, and other causes. I also read something about certain Meniere's disease. I don't know if you've heard about it. Certain Meniere's disease, it's quite difficult to diagnose, I think, because it would require histological proof. So you have to cut your patient's head open uh, to diagnose that, which um, I certainly don't recommend. This is just a short video, just to show. Um, there are many theories about Meniere's disease, and, and everybody really seemed to think that uh, it's the endolymphatic compartment, which has um, got a bit too big, causing the problem. This is um, the video just showing the endolymphatic system and the end endolymphatic sac, which lies in the posterior cranial fossa next door to the cerebellum. Potential pathophysiology. We all know about endolymphatic hydrops, pressure affecting the, um, the uh, organ of corti. Um, in recent histological studies as well, um, they have shown some vestibular fibrosis. There have been study um, postulating that um, rupture of membrane causing release of neurotoxin from endolymphatic. But that doesn't actually explain the fluctuating nature of hearing. Another um, phenomenon that has been described is the sudden shift of fluid from the cochlea into the pars superior. Pars superior is the embryological um, anatomical site of the three semicircular cells. In. And that would, improve, uh, that would uh, explain the improvement of hearing um, during uh, the dizzy attacks in Lemoyes' syndrome. Um, there are also family histories. 10% 10, 10 of the many as disease patients uh, in the European uh, populations, uh, they, they run in the family. It's related to autoimmune diseases, as described there. The endolymphatic sac has immune function, um, but really it's, it's very unclear as in you know, what, what's causing the problem. And there are subtypes of many as having been described as well. Those that you can read on there, classic, classical, delayed, familial, migraine, and autoimmune. One thing that I, I really need to um, sort of talk to you about today is the Tumarkin drop attacks. This is associated with Meniere's disease, and, and these patients have sudden distortion of vertical orientation. So they just drop. But one thing that we need to be sure of is that they drop without loss of consciousness. These patients' cardiovascular systems should be examined to exclude sick sinus syndrome, for example. The loss of consciousness means that it, it might be a cardiac problem rather than Tumarkin. So this is just um, to show you my, uh, the, the person that I learned all my um, vestibular medicine and otology from. Um, some, uh, some, of, some of you may know this uh, gentleman, Professor Bill Gibson. That was in 2005, I did a fellowship with him. And that's me when I was younger. And uh, that little guy now is about 18, my, my, my son, Joshua. So on to um, treatment. Uh, there is a therapeutic ladder for many as disease, medical, diet, uh, diuretics, beta histine, oral steroids. Step two, intratympanic corticosteroids to preserve hearing. Step three, and the lymphatic sac surgery, which is, again, pre uh, hearing preserving as well. Step four and step five are, are more destructive. Step Important key points for step four and step five, the, the intratympatic gentamicin or surgical labyrinthectomy, you have to warn the patient about tinnitus. Tinnitus can be a very, very disabling uh, symptom, and uh, we need to consent them properly before you uh, embark on those med, um, treatments. I'm gonna skip those, I know, I'm aware of the time. So these are the three very good papers that I've read recently uh, to prepare for my talk. And I would uh, recommend you to, to read these as well if you want to find out a bit more about dizziness. Thank you very much. <laughs>